Good morning, this is Ian King Live and our business and economic news from the heart of the city. Well, shares of Microsoft surged by more than 8% in after-hour trading last night after the software giant reported sales and earnings for the first three months of the year that were significantly better than expected. Microsoft reported sales of $52.9 billion for the three months to the end of March. That was up 7% on the same period last year and almost $2 billion better than expected. Well, that was driven largely by strong growth in Azure, its cloud business. Her sales were up 27% on a constant currency basis. Microsoft's earnings during the quarter rose by 9% to $18.3 billion. Meanwhile, Alphabet, the parent of Google, also reported better than expected sales and earnings for the quarter. Well, joining me now live from San Francisco, is our old friend Dan Ives. He's Managing Director and Senior Equity Research Analyst at Wedbush Securities. Dan, good to see you this morning. Thanks for joining me at such an unsociable hour. Looking at your note overnight, you, you clearly loved Microsoft's uh, results, but is it fair to say that expectations were a little depressed going into these results? Yeah, look, I mean, clearly caution going into actual earnings. But I think if you look, I, I mean, this was a flex the muscles moment for big tech. I think Microsoft really shown that enterprise are continuing to spend on the shift to cloud. And we're seeing that with Google as well. And that's great news for investors that have been fearing tech earnings. And I think this continues to be a green light for tech stocks. Now, looking at Azure in particular, up 27% uh, in the quarter on a constant currency basis, that was actually slower than it has been growing at. Is that something people should worry about? Yeah, look, it's slowing, obviously, in a shakier macro, and you're seeing some enterprises, you know, obviously soft and spend. But this is better than expected. And I think, in a what I'll call right now, they're gaining share in their enterprise backyard versus Amazon, AWS. And I think, ultimately, Microsoft, from cloud to AI, is really on the offensive. And I think it speaks to this is a stock that continues to move higher. Absolutely. You mentioned AI. There obviously much excitement about Microsoft's investment in chat GPT. What did we learn last night from what the, the management was saying? Yeah, I think from the Della, this was really sort of opening the, the covers on the AI strategy, just showing that monetization is now actually starting to play out in AI. Look, this is a Game of Thrones going on in terms of AI, not just Microsoft, Google, and obviously every other tech player. And I think this is something that Microsoft's showing that they're going to continue to monetize still early days, and that's going to be a key takeaway today. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Everyone's excited about the prospects for Bing on the back of uh, ChatGPT, but it's actually Copilot, which is uh, integrated into the uh, office suite that potentially offers the, the more exciting growth, would you say? Oh, yeah. I think ultimately that is multitudes more in terms of office enterprise, how they can monetize rather than just search. And I think for Nadella, they, they've sort of cracked the code here on AI, and that's why it's really caused an AI arms race. But if you look at cloud, you look at AI, right now Microsoft really going 85 miles you know, in terms of the left lane versus where I think a lot of other tech players are sort of playing the de defensive to some extent. Microsoft's on the offensive. Well, turning now to uh, Alphabet, uh, obviously ad spend was uh, easing as was expected, but again, they, they surprised the market. Yeah, I think digital advertising, you're seeing some stabilization, and we'll hear from Meta as well. That's important because that's as big of a barometer that you get from digital advertising. YouTube, that's the golden jewel, which we're definitely seeing success there. And then cloud. I mean, GCP for Google, they're gaining in cloud. And this, I think, is something that's still under you know, estimated by the street in terms of what Google is doing in cloud. Very, very important, especially in this type of environment. They mentioned last night that they're raising uh, their capex uh, over the coming uh, quarters. Is a lot of that going to be on cloud-based activity? It is, uh, you know, between that as well as AI. Because Google, they're trying to chase Microsoft, not just on AI, but on cloud. And that's music to the ears of investors. You want to see these tech stalwarts increase in capex, you know, given an environment that's clearly not roses and champagne. And overall, that's a part that the investors slept a lot better last night in terms of these tech earnings. You mentioned, uh, you said this is a bit of a Game of Thrones moment in uh, AI right now. Clearly, Microsoft are ahead. How do you rate the chances of, of Alphabet and others closing the gap on them? Yeah, Alphabet, I mean, they have some probably the best engineers from an AI developer perspective in the world. And then also, don't forget about 
app and what I'll call Apple in terms of what they're going to do over the next call it, few years. I think they could spend upwards of eight to 10 billion. Then you have Amazon as well. And you have other tech players playing now. And I think this is, we view it as an $800 billion market opportunity. Right now it's Microsoft, Google, but I think this is really going to be something that plays out over the coming years. All right, Dan, we've got to leave it there. Thanks again for joining me. It's such an unsocial Thanks, Good to see you. Take care. Some other stories for you now. And the drug maker GSK has hailed strong sales of its blockbuster shingles treatment Shingrix after reporting better than expected quarterly results. While well, operating profits for the first three months of the year on an adjusted basis came in at £2.1 billion. That was unchanged from the same period last year, despite a hit from lower COVID-related sales. Well, sales stripping out COVID solutions were up 10% to £6.8 billion. Dame Emma Walmsley, GSK's chief executive, said the company enjoyed an excellent performance across each of its divisions, vaccines, speciality and general medicines. The house builder Persimmon said this morning that it was seeing early signs of increasing customer confidence, which were particularly evident in demand for its three, four and five bedroom homes. The UK's fourth largest house builder by stock market value said it completed 1,136 homes during the first three months of the year. That was down 42% on those months last year, but as expected given the challenging trading environment in the second half of 2022. But Dean Finch, the chief executive, said in recent weeks the company had seen visitor numbers up, cancellation levels normalising and sales rates continuing the steady improvement evident since the beginning of the year. The household goods giant Racket Benkiza is promoting the head of its health business to become its new chief executive. Chris Licht, who's also Racket's chief customer officer, will take control on the 1st of June. Well, the news came as Racket, whose brands include Mr Sheen, Calgon, Sillit, Bang, Dettol and Eurofen, reported sales of £3.9 billion for the first three months of the year. That was ahead by 7.9% on the same period a year ago on a like-for-like -like basis. And some breaking news for you. And in the last hour, it's been announced that Sir Wynne Bischoff, one of the city's best known and influential figures over the last five decades, has died. Sir Wynne, who was 81, was chairman of Lloyd's Banking Group from 2009 to 2014 and helped support its rehabilitation following the global financial crisis. Before that, he joined, enjoyed a distinguished career at Schroders, now the UK's biggest quoted asset manager, but which was previously one of the biggest and most important British-owned investment banks. Sir Wynne was chief executive of Schroders from 1984 to 1995, when he became chairman, later overseeing the sale of the group's investment banking division to the Wall Street giant City, whose European arm he later chaired for seven years. Now, the government is being urged to develop a strategy to help farmers convert millions of tonnes of cow dung into biogas, which can be pumped into the power grid. The farmer-owned dairy giant Arla, the company behind brands such as Cravendale Milk and Tall Valley Cheese, says more than 100 million tonnes of manure, slurry and food waste is produced by British farms each year and has the potential to be turned into enough biomethane to fuel 6.4 million homes. Well, joining me now to talk about this is James Peary. He's Vice President for Planning and Logistics at Arla. James, welcome to you. Without getting too uh, technical on me, how does the uh, conversion process work? The conversion process works uh, through a process called anaerobic digestion. Uh, and that is a process uh, through the uh, absence of oxygen. And the tanks that have the absence of oxygen that trigger that process are called anaerobic digestures. And that is the process to convert organic matter into energy. And does that process involve the, the use of uh, fossil fuels in any way, such as natural gas? Yeah, so what Arla, which is the UK's largest dairy cooperative, is, is calling for support from the government to support farmers further utilise renewable energy sources, such as biogas, which in turn will support the UK's energy independence and energy security. So biogas is a huge untapped opportunity where we can convert organic matter into a renewable energy resource. Well, we'll get into the numbers in a minute, but uh, what about the uses of biomethane? What, what primarily would it be used for? At the moment, we, the, the opportunity here is you talk about the amount of waste that's produced at the moment within this country. And for context, within the livestock industry, of which Arla farmers are part of that industry, we produce about 91 million tonnes 
of organic waste, whether it's cow slurry or manure, and another 10, 10 tonnes of finished goods waste. The untapped potential of that, if we had the infrastructure and support network to convert that into energy, the opportunity is to power circa 6.4 million homes within the UK. So you've said you want government support. I presume that's largely with equipping uh, farms with these anaerobic digesters. Yeah, that's correct. So there are two things that we're asking for the government for support. The first is a nationwide anaerobic digestion strategy, both at a centralised community and at farm level. And the second is the recognition for more accessible and costly connections to the grid that allows farmers to tap into solar power as another renewable energy resource. What sort of uh, costs are we talking about then? It's a, very diff diff it's a very difficult question to answer. Uh, what today and last week was all about was highlighting the untapped potential. And for another data point, you know, we produce about 170 million tonnes of organic waste each year within the UK. At the moment, we use about a quarter of that waste. If we had the network and infrastructure to unlock all of the energy for 170 million tonnes of waste, the opportunity is 27 million tonnes of CO2 reduction or the equivalent of planting 450 million trees. Would there be much expense involved in converting the gas transmission system? Presumably the grid is going to have to uh, be altered in some way to carry this sort of gas alongside uh, the existing gases it carries. Without doubt, there will be a cost to this transition. But what last week and today is all about is highlighting the untapped potential that we have at this moment in time. We, we live and we work in a world of resource scarcity. And what today is all about is highlighting to the government a huge untapped opportunity in converting the waste that we currently generate into a renewable energy resource. OK, James, got to leave it there. Appreciate you joining me today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Time now for a look at this morning's business pages. And the Financial Times leads its print edition with President Biden's formal launch of his campaign for re-election. The FT is currently leading its online editions with a sharp sell-off yesterday in shares of the California-based lender First Republic, which sank by more than 49% after reporting that its customers had withdrawn $100 billion worth of deposits during last month's turmoil in the banking sector. Well, the Times leads its business pages with news that British American Tobacco has agreed to pay $635 million to US authorities over alleged sanctions busting in North Korea, stretching back a decade. The paper also covers yesterday's report from the Public Accounts Committee, which found that out of an estimated £2.2 billion lost to fraud and error in pandemic grant and loan schemes, only £10 million has so far been recovered. Meanwhile, the Daily Telegraph leads with analysis suggesting that the UK will miss out on £3 billion worth of tourist spending this year as a result of Rishi Sunak's decision when Chancellor to abolish VAT-free shopping for visitors to the UK. The Telegraph suggests it is why spending by tourists in the UK has yet to recover to pre-pandemic levels, while it has in other European countries, most notably France. Uh, joining me to discuss all of that is Artie Natchiapan. She's the economics correspondent at The Times. Artie, good to see you this morning. Before we talk about anything else, we've got to address these comments from uh, Hugh Pill, the bank's uh, chief economist, uh, overnight. I'm just going to play your uh, viewers a little extract of what he said. So somehow in the UK, someone needs to accept that they're worse off and stop trying to maintain their real spending power by bidding up prices, whether higher wages or passing the energy costs through onto customers, etc. And what we're facing now is that, that reluctance to accept that, yes, we're all worse off and we all have to take our share. I mean, Artie, uh, those comments have uh, attracted a lot of interest. It's uh, the front page of the Daily Mail, which has got itself into a right lather about it. Uh, is he a bit tone deaf or, he, or has he got a point? I think the issue here is that you can't have any economics without politics. And it's reminiscent of the comments that Bailey made. And there's the same problem there, is that it ignores all of the context in which people are living in, the kind of lack of real wage growth that we've seen since the financial crisis. And to tell people now that they kind of have to accept being poorer, there are so many problems with the way that that comes across. And I think also the fact that we're dealing with a crisis of essentials at the moment, so it's food and energy that are really pushing up household bills. And if you're a poor 
poorer household, that's going to hit you more than um, than a than a you know a wealthy central banker's household. So I think it's being told that you have to take your share. Well, that share is a lot more painful for a lot of the people that Hugh Pill is talking to um, than than it might be for Hugh Pill himself. I know that's not a personal thing, but if you separate economics from the politics and you kind of talk about it in an economic theory way of okay, well, if everyone in theory um, seeks to increase pay or puts up prices in an effort to maintain profit margins, then yes, you're right that inflation will continue to rise. But is inflation the only target or are we looking at the economy as a whole? Obviously, he's a central banker, so he's talking about inflation. But I just think when you look at these context comments in isolation and there isn't any kind of understanding of what people are dealing with, then they just don't have the impact that that that, that he's trying to have. One thing that struck me is quite interesting, though, Artie, is that he, whilst everyone's alighted on what he's saying about households, he did also say that businesses need to stop bolstering their profit margins and passing on higher costs to consumers. And that's exactly what some of the trade unions have been saying. Yeah, it's very true. And it is important to highlight both sides of the coin because that is the spiral that people are concerned about. And so I think that that was, and that's what Bailey, when he came under fire for his comments, tried to highlight that it's also price setting. It's not just the wages, it's the back and forth response. And I do think that maybe should be more of the focus. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about some of the uh, stories you've picked this morning. And obviously all of the papers, including your own, The Times, has uh, gone on the public borrowing figures yesterday. Yeah, I think this is interesting because we were saying after the OBR forecast came out that Jeremy Hunt has the smallest, a wafer thin margin of headroom to be able to meet his targets after the measures that he announced in March. It's actually the thinnest of any chancellor since the establishment of the OBR in 2010. And now this gives him a little bit more wiggle room. So public borrowing on balance has come in less than expected for the OB that the compared to what the OBR expected for the last year. And so this means that Jeremy Hunt has a little bit more space to either increase spending or cut taxes. But if you look at the reasons why it was a little bit lower, it's mainly because of higher tax receipts. And the tax that grew the most was VAT, mainly because prices at the tail have been going up so much because of inflation. So it does feel a little bit like inflation is feeding through into all areas of, of the government's finances. And this is one in which it has benefited a little bit in the sense that they've got the opportunity now to be able able to ease the burden a little bit where they choose to do it. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what they do with that, won't it? Uh, now, what about the Public Accounts Committee? I mean, again, it's a story covered uh, pretty widely this morning. I think what is interesting about this is that we're talking about a department that ha is currently in the process of being disbanded and its function siphoned off to other government departments. And I think the concern for me would be is if a lot of these failings, failing to recover money lost in fraud and error, some 10 million was recovered of 2 billion, 2.2 billion even lost. I think if that is then all put down to this department that is being disbanded and there's a lack of accountability, I think there could be a real issue that the lessons that need to be learned are not. But equally, you could also see it in the sense that this department wasn't really functioning as it was supposed to, and it is the right time for a rejig. But as we, we know, that's often always a way of passing the buck. <laughs> Very good point. So what do you think then personally about uh, the, the, the business department? Do you, th do you think they are accountable for, for these shortcomings or is it just a more general malaise within Whitehall? I think it's difficult. I definitely think culture comes into it. And um, once you've got so much bureaucracy, there's a lot. It's very easy to say it wasn't, you know, it wasn't us, it, the, this responsibility lay here. Um, but I do think that there have been issues with the department. And I just wonder whether it's coincidental, the timing that we have for a rethink of it. Yeah, very good point you make. Artie, you've got to leave it there. Good to see you this morning. Thank you. And a reminder to check out the Ian King Live podcast, which you can find by scanning the QR code on your screen right now. That's available now wherever you get your podcasts, including the Sky News app, Apple and Google Podcasts and Spotify. Well, still to come here on Ian King Live. We're going to have a look at how the markets are doing this Wednesday morning. Don't go away.
There's always more to the news than a headline. We want to discover, to delve a little deeper, to find out what's really going on. Explanation, analysis, the people at the heart of every story. I'm Neil Patterson, and this is the Sky News Daily Podcast. Alex Crawford joining us now from Ukraine. Their personal possessions are all scattered around the place. Our economics and data editor, Ed Conway, try and make sense of uh, the big numbers for us. Things can change incredibly quickly, and that's what they have done. So, by the end, we'll hopefully all understand what's going on in the world just that little better. Available wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>
Welcome back. Sorry for the uh, slight uh, interference there. We've had a few technical gremlins creeping in, but someone's put another shilling in the meter and we're back and raring to go again. So let me take you without further ado onto the markets. And we're going to start with the currencies. The pound is higher against the US dollar this morning. And Q Pill's comments overnight might have uh, been digested by a few people. Sterling up half of 1% right now against the dollar. There also appears to be a bit of dollar weakness, though, because uh, uh, the euro is up two thirds of 1% against the greenback as well. On the equity markets, well, following last night's sell off on Wall Street as concerns revived over the health of some US regional lenders, there was mixed trading in the Asia Pacific region overnight. The Nikkei in Tokyo, which on Tuesday hit an eight month high, fell by nearly three quarters of 1%, while Hong Kong rallied by a similar amount. Sydney, Mumbai, and Shanghai were more or less all unchanged. Well, in Europe, stocks have been largely trading to the downside so far this morning. All of the main European indices in negative territory right now. It's a busy day for company results. Among the talking points in Europe this morning, Puma, the German sportswear maker, is off two and three quarter percent following a downbeat outlook statement. Well, here in London, the FTSE 100 is also in negative territory right now, uh, currently off uh, a third of one percent. I think some of the big dollar heavyweight earners are weighing on the index this morning, including the health care giants. In percentage terms, the biggest blue chip faller for the second consecutive day is Associated British Foods. That's currently off 5%. That was after its trading update yesterday. It was uh, about 6% off, I think, at one point yesterday. Among the gainers, well, Persimmon mentioned them earlier on in the programme. They're leading gainers and the likes of Taylor Wimpy and Barrett Developments are up in sympathy. Outside the FTSE 100, the power generator Drax is ahead by more than uh, 4% and that is after it announced a £150 million share buyback programme. As for the oil price, well, there was a drop in uh, US crude inventories yesterday and that supported the price. A barrel of Brent crude will currently set you back $80.98 a barrel. That is up a little over a quarter of 1%. Well, joining me this morning is Rachel Winter. She's a partner at Killick Co. Rachel, good to see you this morning. Um, I mentioned Reckitt's res uh, latest results are in the programme. Seem to have gone down quite well. They do, but I think the big surprise here is the new chief executive. Um, so we have had an internal hire being promoted to the chief executive. I think that is a bit of a surprise because it's taken seven months for Reckitt to appoint a new chief executive. And because it was taking so long, I think people assumed there would be an external hire. That isn't the case, but I think the good thing about having someone internal is that you will have more continuity. Yeah, so, and it's always good for morale, isn't it, when someone comes from inside the business to take over the running? It is. I think it's quite inspiring for people who are working there already. Yeah. Now, what about Persimmon? I mean, it's been a bit of a tail away from the builders over the last six months, but a glimmer of hope here. Yeah, so the big headline from them this morning is that completions were down 42% between the first quarter of this year and the first quarter of last year. But if you look at some of the comments from the chief executive, he had said that confidence seems to be returning. They've seen quite a big drop in cancellations, which is good. And they do seem to be having more people coming to look at their properties. So it does feel as though things are on the up. And I think those comments have sent the shares up this morning. Yeah, it kind of feels in keeping with what we've heard in, in terms of the secondary market right now from the likes of right move over recent days. It does indeed. And I think that's because it's becoming easier to find a mortgage. I think if we go back to September post mini budget, it was very difficult for many people to get a mortgage. Now there are more banks offering mortgages. And I think that has brought some confidence back to the housing market. Yeah. Now, one that we haven't talked about this morning is standard chartered share price hasn't really moved, although the results weren't themselves too bad, I didn't think. I thought they were good. So they've had a big increase in interest income because interest rates have gone up so much. But I think with banks, what people are really looking at is deposits. We're really keen not to see any deposit outflows because that's been the big issue for banks like Silicon Valley, Credit Suisse and also First Republic Bank. So the good thing about Standard Chartered is that deposits have remained fairly constant and that shows that people are reasonably confident in the bank at the moment. Now, the, obviously, we, we hear from the other UK lenders over the next few days. I mean, not really that much of a read across, I guess, from Standard Chartered to the likes of Barclays and Lloyds? No, I think Standard Chartered is quite different because it's so exposed to Asia, which I think in the past has been a good thing, but it's so exposed to China that I think some people are becoming concerned about that. Yeah, I mean, we had Santander reporting yesterday. Again, the UK arm did OK. I mean, the stock price, I noticed, was lower in Madrid yesterday. Yeah, I think I feel quite comfortable with UK banks at the moment. I think because interest rates have gone up here so much, I think banks are doing well. I think the regulatory environment here is very strong and that's good for banks. But that's not the case at some overseas banks, which is why there is some concern about the sector elsewhere. Yeah, now the biggest company reporting in the UK today, of course, is GSK, which we mentioned uh, earlier on in the programme. Again, I mean, this company feels like it's turned a corner after 
a few years of travails. It does. So good results this morning. I think revenues were up quite strongly. They've reaffirmed their guidance for this year and their dividend, dividend as well. So that's good news for investors. I think here investors really want to see some more big new blockbuster products. But GSK really is focusing on that. They have got a number of small acquisitions going through. So they really are on the search for a big new drug at the moment. Yeah, I mean, looking at the statement, I think they said they've got something like 68 drugs under development in the pipeline. I mean, that's pretty punchy for, for even for a business of this size. It is. It's a very big number. So let's hope that at least a few of those do go through to become blockbusters. How concerned would you be about uh, the dollar? I mean, obviously, GSK's main market is the US. A lot of their earnings are in dollars. It's always quite interesting to see the pound moving against the greenback on a day like this and GSK coming off despite good results. Yeah, I think investors like the fact that so much of the revenue is in dollars. I think people feel more comfortable with dollars at the moment versus sterling. I think there is still some concern about sterling post-Brexit. So I think I like the fact that there is so much dollar exposure there. OK, now you've also, uh, your eyes been caught by Heathrow today. Yes, a big increase in passenger numbers. Heathrow is apparently back to being the number one busiest airport in Europe. But despite that, the company has made a loss and it won't be paying a dividend this year. The amount they can charge per passenger is set by the Civil Aviation Authority. Heathrow has been complaining that that amount is too low. And I think the fact they're still making a loss does support that perhaps their view is correct. All right, Rachel, got to leave it there. Good to see you this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Just going to break away momentarily from the uh, business news because the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, is speaking in central London about police recruitment. We're just going to have a quick listen in. Their side, not pandering to politically correct preoccupations. It means measuring the police on outputs such as public response times, crime solved and criminals captured. It means police officers freed up to spend their time on proper police work. It means police prioritising the highest harm crimes and those that matter most to the public. It means the police making use of powers like stop and search that have proven effective in taking weapons off our streets. And above all else, common sense policing means officers maintaining a relentless focus on fighting crime, catching criminals and keeping the public safe. And I'm going to speak on each of those items today. Firstly, the public wants to see more bobbies on the beat, and so do I. It is central to common sense policing. Everyone who has been part of the government's police uplift program should be immensely proud of what we've achieved in the last few years. Many said we couldn't do it, but this is a police success, a home office success and a Conservative government success. We've delivered an additional 20,951 officers into policing over the past three years. There are now almost 150,000 police officers across England and Wales, the highest number ever. 24 forces now have more police officers than they ever had before the programme. I'm extremely grateful to police chiefs for leading this drive. And to those men and women who have signed up, you are now part of a policing family epitomised by bravery and dedicated to public service and safety. As part of the new generation of policing, you will help to raise standards, refocus priorities and maintain our world leading place in policing. Policing must remain open to the best and the bravest, whether or not they have a degree. And common sense policing means encouraging the recruitment of officers that come from and live in the communities they serve, familiar with local challenges and familiar... There you go. If you want to uh, carry on watching Suella Braverman, the Home Secretary, and uh, hearing her speech on police recruitment, you can do so by scanning the QR code on your screen right now. Now, leaked network rail documents recently suggested that delays on the... Uh, I think well, that's the wrong story. Uh, let me come to the next story. 
Live events have bounced back since the end of COVID restrictions with some tours uh, set like that of the comic Peter Kay selling out more than two years in advance. However, according to recent polling, half of Britain say they've been priced out of going to see live music in recent years. Undeterred by that, the O2 is to open a live exclusive VIP members club with a 300 person capacity at the venue residence called The Residence. Oh, joining me now to talk about this is Paul Samuels. He's executive vice president at AEG Global Partnerships. Paul, welcome to you. Good morning. Um, clearly, uh, you're not worried about the cost of living crisis. Uh, we're seeing people still coming to live events. We are selling uh, more shows than ever before. 2022 was our, uh, 23 was our biggest year yet. And uh, the, uh, last year was our biggest year yet. And this year seems to be even bigger than that. How much are these memberships going to cost? The memberships will cost £15,000 a year. Uh, this is an ultimate... Uh, VIP experience. You will have amazing views uh, of the stage. Uh, you will have a private restaurant you can use. There's, there's going to be a floating champagne bar, cocktail bar. But the bit I'm most excited about is we're having a walkway that will come out above the crowd uh, in the audience um, by nine metres, where you'll be able to have that ultimate selfie moment uh, and have a picture in front of the stage before it retracts before the show starts. So it's a really great experience for people to come to the venue. And you'll only be selling 300 of these? There's 300 of them, they're gonna sell very quickly. Uh, premium um, offerings at the O2 are all sold out. We have um, our premium suites, uh, we have our VIP licenses. So this is a new um, venture for us, but we know the demand is there, uh, so we're expecting to sell out very quickly. And are you targeting corporate uh, customers here, or do you think some rich individuals will buy these as well? It, it will be both. Uh, we see it as um, individuals that want to, you know, to have those, but also for businesses and also the SME market, people that maybe can't use a corporate or premium suite uh, for, you know, we have over 200 shows a year uh, at the venue, so it's a lot of hospitality. So some people might prefer to have just four seats for those 200 plus shows. Typically, what proportion of sales at the venue do go to corporate buyers now? Do, do you have a handle on that? Um, it's a it's a small percent in the overall side. I mean, we're very keen to ensure that the, the, the O2 is open to everyone, that tickets, all different price points are available so everyone can enjoy the experience when they're there. Are you concerned about some of this polling, though, that suggests people do feel themselves being priced out of going to live events? We haven't seen that in, in reality, be that at our venues like the O2, uh, or our music festivals. We have a music festival called American Express Presents uh, BST in Hyde Park, um, which uh, happens in the summer. And we sell out of that very, very quickly. And the premium piece uh, also sells very quickly. But the price point has only gone up by about 3% since uh, 2019. So we've not seen that kind of issue where people aren't buying tickets. What about uh, inflation? I mean, it's obviously uh, the, the topic of, of the, the year, really, I guess. I mean, where are you seeing inflation most rampant in your cost base? Of course, you know, the cost of, you know, electricity to put on, put on shows, you know, it puts out the cost of putting on these shows, but we've not really seen it affect uh, people coming to the venue, buying tickets and spending money uh, in the venue. People are still spending money. In fact, uh, people are spending more and more than they, than they have in the past. Labour, is that an issue for you? It was coming out of, um, out, of, out of COVID, but now we've all settled down. We, we don't have any issues there at all. One of the big things that uh, kept coming up for me during COVID, we, we had a lot of people on from the live events industry and people saying, well, lighting technicians, sound uh, specialists, uh, they're, they're dropping out of the industry. Has that been an issue for you or are there, is there plenty of talent still out there? I, I think we're, we're back now to the, to the levels that we were pre-pandemic, uh, thankfully. Um, so we don't have it as much of an issue that it, than it was. It was a worry, of course, but we're now back to where it should be. All right, Paul, got to leave it there. Appreciate you joining me today. Thank, Thank you very much. Now, leaked network rail documents recently suggested that delays on the railways will get worse over the next five years. A confidential presentation seen last week by the Independent newspaper suggested current funding levels are not enough for network rail to operate, maintain and renew its tracks, bridges and infrastructure. The railways were hit particularly hard by the pandemic and passenger numbers remain 25% below pre-COVID levels. Well, joining me now is Mark Venables. He's managing director at Megabus and a former head of the project management office at the Department for Transport. Mark, welcome to you. Now, you're of the view that Network Rail fully deserves to have its budgets cut, I gather. I wouldn't quite go that, that far, but I, I think certainly they, they need, to be, um, need to be taking the action that they're taking. Uh, it, it's in everybody's interest that public transport is attractive and affordable. So it, it's right that they focus in on, on making cost reductions wherever they can um, so that they can hopefully better deliver 
uh, reliability and, and, and affordable travel. Um, the, the other point I would make is that it, it sometimes feels a bit scary when we talk about the railway potentially scaling back, but there are other public transport alternatives out there, which is um, which is clearly what, what we offer at, at Megabus and, and Scottish CityLink in, in Scotland as well. Absolutely. So uh, what are you, uh, what's, what's your offer to passengers right now? How are you trying to get them off the trains and onto the coaches? Well, ideally, we'll get them off out of cars and into coaches rather than off the trains. But um, but certainly, uh, it, it's an awful lot cheaper to travel by coach. And, it, and it's a very similar product offering. And, and by that, I mean, um, it, it, it's scheduled. So there's a, there's a set departure time, there's a set arrival time. Um, and, and the fares are, are, let's say, even today between Bristol and London, you can travel for under five pounds, which is astonishingly cheap. Uh, if, if you look on a, a rail retail website, you're going to be paying 35, 40 pounds for the same. Um, between Glasgow and Edinburgh, for example, we are every 15 minutes. So it really is just walk up and go. Um, that's every 15 minutes between the, the, the two biggest cities in Scotland. Um, and we, we cover all of the UK, all the big towns and cities. So, uh, and in terms of journey time, yeah, the, the train is usually a bit quicker, but not always. And sometimes there's very little in it. So for, for example, again, uh, we, we have a service between Leeds and Liverpool. Uh, it's about 90 minutes from 90 minutes and the train's about the same. So there's, there's, there's very often nothing in it. So the, yeah, well, the alternative. I mean, you, ma you mentioned the Bristol to London route there. I mean, I, I can't see how you can possibly be quicker than the train, not with these interminable roadworks up and down the M4. <laughs> well, the, the drivers are very, very competent, and we have um, a, a 24 7 control room, so we know what's going on and we know how to um, minimize disruptions wherever they can. But it does happen. That, that, that can happen on the railway as well, though. Um, but yeah, generally Bristol, London, the train's a bit quicker, but again, it depends exactly where you want to go. So if you want to go get off um, out of town um, at, at Bristol and you can get dropped off at, at the University of West of England, for example, or in London, you don't necessarily want to go to Paddington. When you get off the train at Paddington, you might then have to buy another ticket or pay for a taxi or find some other way of getting a, across to different parts of, uh, of the city. Whereas um, the, the coaches, Megabus, go from... Victoria Coach Station. Now, uh, your parent company, Stagecoach, of course, was taken over last year by DWS Infrastructure. Has, has that changed the way that you're operating at all? It has a little. So Stagecoach uh, are a minority shareholder in, in Megabus and Scottish CityLink. Um, we're, we're not fully owned by them anymore. So, yeah, it has changed, changed things a little. All right, Mark. I'm so sorry. We're, we're, we're pushed for time now because we've had a few technical gremlins. Hopefully, see you again in future. Thank you. OK. Now, as we've been reporting more or less daily, food price inflation is at a 45-year high. That's one of the number of challenges faced by the sandwich and coffee chain Pret-a-Manger, which has also been grappling with higher labour costs and changing working patterns that have affected footfall in city centres. Well, today, the company has announced it's expanding its coffee subscription loyalty scheme to cover food, snacks and some cold drinks. Joining me now to talk about this is Pano Christou. He's the chief executive of Pret. So, Pano, welcome to you. What's the thinking behind expanding this? scheme? Well, I think uh, once we launched the Coffee Subscription in 2020, it's been a, a great success and our customers have really loved uh, the programme. I think the average coffee subscriber last year saved the equivalent of £600, so about £50 a month. And uh, we've, we've been thinking long and hard on what to, to invest in. And I think moving to Club Prep, which now has food discounts as well on top of that. So we see that the average uh, Club Prep member this annual savings will move from £600 to £800. Uh, you know, we've had a, a lot of uh, challenges over the last year or so, as many other companies have around inflation. Uh, I've been very proud to see what we've done in investing in our people, and we'll continue to do that. But I, I think what Club Pret does is really acknowledges, uh, and thanks, uh, our, our customers that have been so loyal to us. And for those that maybe want to join the programme, you have a food discount as well as up to 150 drinks a month. Yeah, now you are also uh, raising the uh, cost of a monthly subscription from 25 to 30 pounds. Yes, we are. Um, but I think we still see this is absolutely amazing value for money. We uh, have seen food prices. Um, obviously, as we, I've said, we've invested in our people and energy uh, prices continue to grow. 
But I, I think from our perspective, you know, we're focused on looking after our people and continuing to invest in our people and then giving our customers great value, which we believe Club Prep will build on the success of the coffee subscription. Now, we did get a bit of evidence yesterday that uh, grocery price inflation may have peaked. More broadly, are you seeing that yet with food and drink inflation? I'm not sure if it's peaked yet. I, th I think it's still to see how it plays out. You know, clearly, uh, food inflation has continued to move and uh, overall inflation is stubbornly high. Um, I think that uh, obviously government support for energy costs uh, have come away this month. Uh, so I think it'd be really interesting to see what companies do. But from our perspective, uh, I think we are, you know, not passing on all the price that we get. We're trying to take on uh, and mitigate uh, to the best of our ability. We, we can't totally weather that, but I think we want to ensure that we give great value to our customers. And, and I think that's something we'll be focused on. Well, to that end, what, what have you made of these comments overnight from Hugh Pill, the Bank of England's chief economist? I mean, he's basically said people shouldn't ask for pay rises and companies shouldn't look to pass on price increases. Well, I, I think, you know, from Pret's perspective, we're focused on two things. Number one is giving uh, our teams uh, the right pay to ensure they are looked after during these challenging environments. And I think if, you know, the inflation is high, we will continue to look after our people and ensure that our people can live the lives that they deserve to live. And, and I think the other focus will be ensuring we've got great value for our customers. So obviously the, the government and Bank of England are, are, are accountable for looking after their inflation. But from our perspective, you know, our people and our customers is what uh, we will continue to, to look after. And over the last year, we've given our staff uh, almost a 20% increase. And I wouldn't be surprised if we're having to come back this year and, and do that again if inflation stays where it is. That's really, I mean, so basically you're doing exactly what uh, Hugh Pill doesn't want you to do. I think you've raised salaries three times over the last year and you're also putting up your prices. You're doing exactly what he doesn't want people and companies to do. I, I, I acknowledge, you know, his point of view. And I, I think that if inflation does come down, we, we will look to, 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 to manage things in, in the way that, that we can and to the best of our ability. But, uh, you know, I think our staff, you know, come in very early in the morning, work extremely hard for us. We are looking after our people in, in the right way um, and supporting them through this difficult time. Pano, before I let you go, you've just opened your first outlet in India. Is it too soon to say how that's going? Um, it's, it's, uh, it opens on Friday, so very excited with the opening. It's been a phenomenal success. Uh, we have our second location opening in Mumbai uh, in the next three to four weeks or so, and then we'll also be opening in Delhi later this year. So the the prep brand seems to be translating well across the world uh, and i think india is an example of that as well all right pano got to leave it there great to see you this morning thank you thank you now in 10 days from now in fact less than that uh, the coronation of his majesty the king will take place at westminster abbey and memorabilia and souvenir sellers have been gearing up among them is halcyon days founded in 1950 which specializes in english made luxury goods in the form of enamel wear english fine bone china enamel jewelry and silk accessories well joining me now is its chief executive pamela Harper. Pamela, good to see you this morning. Uh, you've linked, launched five limited edition collections to mark the coronation. Which one is selling best right now? Uh, well, there are, there are two that are doing very well indeed. And if I may, I'll just show you a piece, Ian. Um, this is um, one which we call the celebration of the natural world. And it's a celebration of all the things that we know our king uh, loves and admires. So the flora and fauna of the British Isles, um, and it's a wonderfully hand-drawn piece. Um, and this has gone down very well. I think also because we have a charity donation attached to the sales of this uh, particular range, which is to the Princess Countryside Fund, which supports rural communities across the UK. So that one has been very well received. And then at the other end of the scale, um, this rather joyous and naive uh, depiction of Westminster Abbey with the lovely Golden State coach arriving, or in fact will be, will be departing uh, with the King and Queen after the coronation. This one is doing really well because I think it brings um, a sort of slightly naive but rather fun uh, approach to the coronation. And of course we're known for our very traditional pieces, but this one has done very well also. Pamela, you, the first piece you held up there has the King's new cipher. Uh, 
it hasn't been uh, released to the public that long. Uh, did you have enough time to incorporate it into all the designs? Uh, Ian, you hit on, a, on, a, on something that was uh, really difficult for us because, of course, we started work on the Coronation Collections last autumn. Um, and uh, I, I, I can't remember the exact date, but I think it was the end of March when the cipher was released. And of course, we had all the product ready to receive the cipher. Um, but it's been a race against time. It absolutely has. Um, you know, quality, quality product does take time to design, to get all the raw, more raw materials in. We started design immediately. We've start, started building our whiteware as far back as, as October um, because we anticipated about a, an extra 150,000 pieces that we would need to make uh, to supply demand, both the UK and international uh, for the coronation. So it's been a race against time, it absolutely has, but we're shipping daily and uh, so far keeping our customers happy. And I gather, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Pamela, I think all of your production is now in the UK. It is, and we're very, very proud of that. We have two factories, the one I'm standing in, which is our fine bone china factory in Stoke-on-Trent, which is an entirely handmade factory. We have um, 50 very highly skilled staff, many of whom have been with us for over 40 years. Um, and the skills involved in creating a product of this quality are incredible, whether that's in the whiteware part of the factory or in fact in the gilding and decorating. And then our second factory is in Wolverhampton, where we have our enamel factory, which of course is the original factory of Halcyon Days, the enamelware part of our business. So yes, and we've been reshoring uh, over COVID. We didn't have a lot overseas, but we did have, for example, our silk made in Italy. We've reshored that into the UK. And some of our component parts where we still were bringing in from, uh, in, in certain cases, Vietnam, uh, we've actually reshored everything. So we're, Pamela, we're about 93% English made. Have, I'm sorry, Pamela. Good to see you this morning. Thank you. I'm back tomorrow. Hopefully see you then. Jane Tech is up next. <laughs>